We're going to open God's word and let's pray together before we do. Father, this is a great weekend. It's just just a wonderful, wonderful, blessed weekend, an opportunity to share, an opportunity to rejoice. And now for a few moments, we're going to focus our mind on the text of Scripture. And as we open your word, we pray that you'd help us to grow and to draw closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. A number of years ago, my wife and I were entertaining one Sabbath, and we had a family with us that we were eating lunch with. They had two children. One was about six and probably the other about eight. And as we adults were talking during the conversation, I immediately observed that these kids weren't very much involved in the conversation. Attempting to get the six-year-old talking a little bit, I looked at him and said to him, now, Sonny, do you go to school? And he looked at me in all seriousness and said, I used to six years old. I said, oh, you used to? He said, oh, yeah, I'm a kindergarten dropout. (laughs) Now, I have heard of a high school dropout, and I have heard of college dropouts, and I have heard of medical school dropouts, but this one was a new one for me. I am a kindergarten dropout. Have you ever started a project and you've had difficulty finishing it? Some runners run a race and they're way out front at the start. But when you finish the race, they are lagging behind and they've dropped out. Some people begin a project like cleaning a garage. And they do great for the first 14 minutes. And then seeing the task and being overwhelmed by it, they drop out. And there are some people that really grow in their Christian life for a short period of time. But they're not in it for the long haul. They don't endure. They don't persevere. And they drop out. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews largely to a group of Jews who had become Christians, and he wrote it so that they would persevere. He wrote it so that they would hang in there for the long haul. He wrote it so that they would hold fast. He wrote it so that they would endure for the end. And I want to talk to you this morning about how to thrive in the tough times ahead and about how to not throw in the towel when the Christian life becomes difficult, when the journey is long, when the mountain is high, when you're emotionally exhausted in Christianity, and you're about ready to say, I'm going to walk away. How do you hang on? How do you thrive in the Christian life when things don't go the way you had wished or they don't go the way you hoped. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to take it and take a brief journey with me through the book of Hebrews. We're going to ultimately come to Hebrews chapter 12, but I want to spend some time focusing on those earlier chapters, Hebrews the third chapter. The Apostle Paul writes the book of Hebrews to a group of Jewish Christians who are living during a time of Roman persecution. The times are tough in the writing of the book of Hebrews. There are Christians that are being burned at the stake. There are Christians that are being thrown thrown to lions. There are Christians who are being persecuted, maligned in every way. And the Apostle Paul is concerned. He's concerned about this Christian family. And he longs for them to grow. He longs for them to hang on. He longs for them not to give up. We begin with Hebrews, the third chapter. We're looking there at verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to, firm to the end. Paul says to the Hebrew Christians, when things get tough, hold on. When get, things get tough, don't give up. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse. You see this theme as a re-echoing refrain that comes back again and again throughout the book. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, 
let us, next two words, what are they? Hold fast our confession. In other words, don't give up. Focus your attention on Jesus Christ who will give you strength in your weakness, wisdom in your ignorance, and who will enable you to persevere in the tough times. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, same theme coming back again and again and again throughout the Scripture. Hebrews 6, verse 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish. That's an interesting expression, isn't it? Before you drop out, before you leave the race, you tend to become spiritually sluggish. Weak prayer life, little Bible study life, sluggishness, occasional church attendance. So Paul says here that you do not become sluggish in your faith, but that vibrancy of faith, that fervency of faith, that dynamism of faith, that grip your heart, so that you still have that excitement when you come to God in prayer. You still have that excitement when you come to study the Bible. I'll tell you one thing. When you're with Christina and Tyler, they have an excitement about one another. They are in the freshness of the bloom of love. I mean, you know that when you're around them for five seconds. And there's something about maintaining that freshness, not only in marriage, but in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Having that freshness, that dynamic experience with Him, not a sluggish, passive experience. So it says that you do not become sluggish, but you imitate those through faith and patience inherit the promises. So here in Hebrews, hold fast. Here in Hebrews, don't give up. Here in Hebrews, endure to the end. Here in Hebrews, don't become sluggish. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. You see this reoccurring a theme through the book. Hebrews 10, verse 23 and 24. The scripture says, Let us again hold fast the confession of our faith. That word hold fast, that expression, is an interesting expression in the Greek language. It is cling to. It is never let go of. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast. Remember the song we sang at the beginning? I was impressed with the first verse and knowing a little bit about the background of the author of the song, it really made it more uh, meaningful to me. We sung a song that says, Hold fast till I come. The first verse says, Sweet promises given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come. The danger is great. Sleep not as others. Be watchful and wait. Hold fast till I come. Sweet promise of heaven. The kingdom restored to you shall be given. Come in, come enter my joy. Sit down on my throne. Bright crowns are in waiting. Hold fast till I come. Now that song was written by F.E. Belden. If you look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church hymnal, F.E. Belden has 20, 25 songs in the Adventist Church hymnal. Belden was an amazing man. He and his wife would sit in an audience, and he had just this gift to write hymns. And they would sit in an audience, and the preacher would be preaching, and Belden would take out his pen and start writing. By the time the preacher got through with the sermon, Belden would have a song written on the topic of the sermon, and he and his wife would slip up to the pulpit and they would sing the song as the appeal song with music and everything and words all done by the time the preacher got through. And it was F.E. Belden that wrote this hymn, Hold Fast Till I Come. Sweet promise is given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come. The danger is great. The danger was great for F.E. Belden because you may be aware of the fact that in 1905 he had a conflict with certain leaders in the church, gave up his faith, and walked away from everything that he wrote about and everything he sung about. How do you keep a vibrant faith? How do you keep from dropping out? When the days get tough and the end time bursts upon God's people, how do you persevere with that vibrant faith? 
Paul ends the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, bringing everything that he has discussed up until this point and focuses it on two Bible passages, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look there at Hebrews 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, now he finishes Hebrews 11, the great chapter on the worthies of faith, and he begins Hebrews 12, verse 1 with, therefore. And as one theology teacher often said to his students, what is the therefore, therefore? What is the therefore, therefore? Therefore connects everything that comes in chapter 11 with what's come before it, in rather everything that comes in chapter 11 with what comes after it in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And everything that comes in chapter 12, 1 and 2 with what's come before. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily besets us or ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. So let's pause here on verse 12. Paul gives you the illusion of a runner, a runner who runs into a stadium. And he talks about this expression, the cloud of witnesses. Have you ever seen a cloud of birds over a cornfield in Minnesota? You know, you look up at these clouds. You can hardly see the sky sometimes because you get these hundreds and hundreds of birds, thousands of Or you see clouds that hang and hover low. Paul talks about we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. And he uses an interesting expression that is quite apropos in an Olympic year. My wife and I spent two weeks ago in London, in England, uh, where I spoke for a week at one of our Adventist camp meetings there. And the great buzz in London is everybody's talking about the Olympics. You know, they start in a couple weeks, and the English are going to do that up as only the English can do, building a new stadium. Well, this whole tradition of the Olympic Games carried on through Greece and various forms of games came down to Rome as well. In the Roman Colosseum, you could seat 60,000 people easily, but that was nothing when you compare it to the Circumus Maximus, where you could seat 120,000. Some of you have traveled with me through the Middle East, and you know that the great stadiums in Turkey and Ephesus, the great biblical city of Ephesus, that stadium sat about 20,000. The stadium in Laodicea sat about 15,000. So I want you to imagine Paul's illusion in your, in your mind. And I'd like to put it in the context of the Olympics. You remember in the Olympics when you have the marathon, the race is 26.2 miles. Now, you, have you ever seen the Olympics on television where the marathon runner is running, sweating, perspiring, straining every muscle, enters the Olympic Stadium to make his final lap. And the thousands and thousands of witnesses in that stadium to history being made, if he is setting a world record, are on their feet cheering. They're encouraging him on. They're saying, don't drop out now. They're saying, keep on, strain every muscle. You can do it. You can finish. It's going to be a world record, and people are cheering and clapping. So Paul, coming from the tradition of the ancient Roman games, says here in Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and he says, imagine yourself as a Christian. You're at the final lap of the race. You come into the stadium, and all the witnesses down through the ages are encouraging you on. Now, who are these great cloud of witnesses? Though they being dead, yet their lives speak to us. Who are this great cloud of witnesses that cheer on believers in a final generation? Who are they? They're the worthies of Hebrews chapter 11. So these worthies are cheering us on. So when you are thinking of dropping out, 
When the road is long, when the journey is tough, when the mountain is high, listen to the echo of the voices of the past. Let's look at some of them and imagine what they might be saying. We go to Hebrews chapter 11. We look there at verse 4. It speaks about Abel. Who was Abel? Cain killed Abel because Abel was faithful to God and made sacrifice to God as God instructed. So imagine Abel crying out these cloud of witnesses. Though they be dead, though they are sleeping in their graves, the witness of their lives speaks to us. And Abel says, keep going. God will sustain you even unto death. Trust God. The next one we read about in verse 5 is Enoch. And Enoch says, you can be translated without seeing death. Don't give up now. We read about Noah. And Noah says, even in a skeptical world, don't cast out your faith. Keep going. Persevere. We read about Abraham who stepped out of his country. And it's as if Abraham is cheering us on. It's as Abraham is saying to you, look, trust the promises of God. This is the, these are the great cloud of witnesses. Sarah says, my womb was weak, but you can find strength and weakness. Trust God. If you feel weak, you can be strong. Joseph says, you can be victorious even in a sinful world. I lived in the midst of the wealth, the splendor, the materialism, the immorality of Egypt. Potiphar's wife paraded herself before me. But even in a sinful, decadent world, Joseph shouts to you, don't give up your faith now. Moses says, keep your eyes focused on the promised land. For 40 years I wandered through the wilderness. The great worthies of faith inspire us. The great worthies of faith encourage us. The great worthies of faith say, persevere, hang on, endure, hold fast. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Paul goes back to this illusion of athletics. The ancient Roman athletes always trained for their races with weights. They strapped those weights not simply around their legs. I remember when my son wanted to dunk a basketball. Oh, that was, you know, as... As a young student, that was his great dream. Dad, I want to be able to jump up there and dunk that basketball. So he took weights and strapped them around his legs. And he would go to class, these legs around his, weights around his legs, and Mark, what you doing that for? He said, Dad, they're going to make my legs stronger. The ancient Roman runners did not strap legs or weights around their legs. You know what they did? strapped weights around their core, around their waist, and around their chest. And they would train running up mountains, really, but with these weights. And when they came to the final race, they would strip off these weights, and they would glide along in that race. The ancient Roman runners provided a model for Paul. Paul says, the cloud of witnesses is cheering us on in the stadium. And he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Now notice he distinguishes between weights and sins. Distinguishes between them. Weights and sins. What's the difference? The weight can be something good that distracts you from the best. There are many good things in life but if those good things that you do distract you from the best thing, if your life is overwhelmed in good things, and they become the object of your attention to the exclusion of the best thing, Paul says, what is it in your life that is like the weight to you? That thing that distracts you, that thing that absorbs your time, that thing that takes up your energy, what is it in your life that has become a weight for you? Paul says, strip it off. It's just not worth it. Then he says, 
Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily ensnares us. What is that sin that so easily ensnares us? What, what's he talking about there? Every one of us in life, you see, the devil studies our genetic predispositions. He knows our backgrounds. He knows, so I've had people that I've talked to and they've said, you know, pastor, I can't control my temper. Why not? You should see my father. And if you think he loses his temper, you should see my grandfather. I mean, I just come from a whole line of people that just explode when we get angry. Or I've had people say to me, well, pastor, I just can't control my appetite. I mean, it's in my whole family. It's part of my genes. Well, the sin that so easily besets us, the devil studies your genetic background. He knows exactly the places you are most likely to fall. In addition to that, the devil studies where we've cultivated before those sinful practices. And so the devil knows where we are, where our bent is, our leaning is, and he also knows where our practices are, the things that we've done. So he parades those temptations before us. Paul says, lay aside that sin that you are so prone to fall on again and again and again. Know yourself. Know the places that you are vulnerable. Know the places that you're likely to fall. Then Paul comes to his major point, verse 2. And he answers the how in that question. How do we pers persevere? How do we endure? How do we hold fast? And Paul comes to Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Notice what Paul said. He says, the only solution to endurance, the only solution to perseverance, the only way that you are going to get through to the end of the race is focusing on where you look. Looking unto whom, everybody? Looking unto who? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, he tells you, before we take a look at what it means to look at Jesus, Let's look at where not to look. The first thing he says is, don't look within. In other words, if you're looking to Jesus, there are four places you don't look. One, you don't look within. When I look in myself, what do I see? I see guilt. I see shame. I see condemnation. There are some Christians that I talk to that they're constantly looking at themselves, and all they see is failure. All they see is disappointment. When I look at myself, I see condemnation, shame, and disappointment. When I look at Jesus, I see righteousness and strength and hope and courage. I remember I was counseling with a young man once, and he came to me and said, Pastor Mark, we need to talk. Now, this guy was so thin, if a wind blew, it would blow him away like a feather. And so he said, Pastor Mark, we got to talk. Sure, let's talk. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about the fact that I have an appetite I can't control, and I'm always overeating. Well, I said, first, I got to ask him about bulimia and anorexia. Just be sure there's nothing there. So I checked that out. I knew what questions to ask. So I checked him out. No, that wasn't the problem. But I looked at the guy. He kept saying to me, Pastor Mark, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm eating too much. I said, how much are you eating? One meal a day. Well, what are you eating in your one meal a day? It was minimum. I mean, it couldn't, it couldn't support a sparrow. And he said, I just have to get my appetite under control. I thought, brother, as I began to talk to him, this is what I discovered. This guy was so focused on his behavior, so concerned that he might do some little thing wrong, that he was killing himself. He was looking in the total wrong direction. His eyes were focused on his guilt, his shame, and his condemnation. Four places not to look. One place to look. The Bible says, looking to who, everybody? Jesus. 
That means I am not looking in my heart constantly and seeing the wickedness there. I'm looking to Jesus. I see his righteousness. I see his greatness. I see his majesty. And looking to him, I become like him. Looking at my weakness, I become weak. Looking at my frailty, I become frail. Looking at my condemnation and my guilt and shame, I feel more condemned. But looking to Jesus, I see his righteousness. Secondly, first, you don't look within you. The secondly, you don't look around you. you. Don't look around you. There are many young Christians particularly. They put great confidence in a pastor, and I praise God for that. I recognize that responsibility that we have as pastors to set positive ideals for young people. There are young people that put great confidence in church leaders. And often, if a church leader lets them down, it so devastates their faith that they don't endure and they walk away. There's a statement in Ellen White's writings that to me is powerful. And it applies not only to young people, but to each of us. It's found in the book Ministry of Healing, page 476. Listen to this. We are prone. What's the word prone mean? What's that word? We are prone. What's prone? Likely. Inclined to. We are prone to look to our fellow man for sympathy and uplifting instead of looking to who? Jesus. Now listen to this. In his mercy, that is in Christ's mercy, and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us. Wow. What does God do? What does God do? He lets those we place confidence in to do what? Fail us. God is allowing that to happen? That's strange, isn't it? Let me continue. In his mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us. Why? In order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Let us trust fully, humbly, unselfishly in God. So God at times will allow leaders to let you down. God at times will allow human beings to fail you. And you have two responses to that. One response is, I can't have confidence in leadership. I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm going to give up. The second response is, Jesus, thank you for teaching me a lesson I want to look to Jesus as my strength, as my righteousness, as the one that will get me through every crisis. What do you say? Four places not to look. Number one, you don't look in yourself because all you're going to see is condemnation. You look to Jesus, you see his greatness. Number two, you don't look around you because if you do, people are going to let you down. And when they let you down, you're simply going to become discouraged. Thirdly, you don't look behind you. You don't look behind you. You can never run a race forward by looking backwards. If you look behind yourself to your failures, if you look behind yourself to all the things that should have done, I should have done this, I could have done that, maybe I should have done this. If you look behind yourself constantly and review your life looking at the past, you're simply going to be filled with discouragement. 1954, Vancouver, Canada. I wanted a good Canadian illustration. <laughs> right, Tim? You, you got it. 1954. The British Empire Games were held in Vancouver. Now, some of us, I was only nine years old then, and uh, so I don't remember it, but I remember reading the story. The two fastest men in the world were Roger Bannister and John Landy, two fastest men in the world. These guys ran the mile race. They were quick. And every Canadian knew, and everybody from the United States knew, that they could bet that one of these two guys was going to win the race. Now, Bannister and Landy had two different racing styles. Landy got out fast. He was quick, really fast. Bannister would keep his pace and measure it and in the last quarter of a mile pick it up and he knew that he couldn't get too far behind Landy. 
as the race began, Landy took his normal position and he took off. He was leading most of the race. And within a half a mile, the race came down to two people, Roger Bannister and John Landy. They were coming into the last quarter mile. And as they came into that last quarter mile, the crowd was on its feet. I mean, they were cheering, they were screaming, they were yelling. They came to the last 100 meters, the last 50 meters. And just as they were rounding the corner, Landy, who was ahead by about four steps, heard this roar of the crowd, this tremendous roar, and he knew exactly. He knew Bannister was pulling up to his side, and he knew. They came three feet from the tape, and here's where Landy made his biggest mistake. He looked over his right shoulder to see where Bannister was, and Bannister passed him on the left side and won the race. Now, if you're visiting Vancouver today, if you're visiting Vancouver, British Columbia, you will see in the sports center a bronze statue. And the bronze statue has two men coming to the tape. And it has this moment captured in bronze with Landy looking over his right shoulder and Bannister passing him on the left. You never are successful in running the Christian race if you're looking behind you. There are some of you that look back passed over your life, and you look like this. You know, I should have made different decisions with my children. I should have made this decision. I should have made that decision. There are some of you that look back over your past life, and you say, I should have made this business decision. You, some of you say, you know, I really failed in this point or that point. All you have is today and today and today. You will never persevere to the end in the Christian life if you look within. There's only guilt and shame. You'll never persevere if you look around you because leaders will fail you. You'll never persevere if you look behind you. But there's one other place you don't want to look. You don't want to look too far ahead of you. There are some people, you see, you don't look within, you don't look without, you don't look behind, and you don't look too far into the future. There are some people that worry if it's going to rain tomorrow, they get a stomach ulcer. They are prone to worry. They're always worrying. Oh, man, my, my, my children aren't home yet. Um, they didn't call me. Uh, they, they, sh they should have called me. Nervous, anxiety, uh, tension. Um, they, they're, they're constantly worried about the future. Uh, what's going to happen with this decision in business? What's going to happen in that decision in business? If you allow yourself to be consumed with worry, the joy of your Christian life will be destroyed. I do not look within. I do not look without. I do not look behind, and I do not look too far into the future. Where do I look? Hebrews 12, verse 2. Please take your Bible. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2, the Scripture says. Let's go back and read verse 1 and 2. Therefore, we're, since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, the great worthies of faith are cheering us on. They're saying, persevere, hold on, hold fast. Lay aside every weight. What is the weight in my life that's keeping me from running the race? Every sin, what sin is it that's strangling my spirituality? Let's run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, not looking within, not looking behind, not looking without, not looking before, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Somebody says, Pastor, make it plain. What does it mean to look to Jesus? What does that mean in simple, practical terms? How do I look to Jesus every day? How do I get strength and courage from Him? How can I look to Him and find the inspiration to endure? How can I look to Him and find the courage to hold fast? Hebrews helps us in that way. There are three aspects of Jesus' life that I want to meditate on for a moment. Go back to Hebrews chapter 2. The first thing that I look at, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Three things to look at in the life of Jesus. Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus. 
You have that all through the book of Hebrews, but we see looking at, beholding, considering. But we see Jesus, Hebrews 2 verse 9, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. We see Jesus who tasted death for everyone, looking at the cross of Calvary, imagining the nails driven through his hands and the blood running down his wrists, seeing the crown upon, of thorns upon his head, sensing that Jesus Christ bore the curse of, Calv of, of sin upon Calvary, sensing that all the condemnation, all the shame of sin came upon Jesus, thinking about the fact that Jesus took my shame, my guilt, my condemnation, thinking about the fact that Christ was willing to go into the grave and never come out, that he was willing to be lost forever for me so I could have a place in eternity thinking about the reality that there is nothing that Jesus Christ would have done for me to save me, that his love is so great, his love is so broad, his love is so magnificent that the most important thing on Christ's mind is to save me. What does it mean to look to Jesus? First, I look to the cross, and there my condemnation is gone. There my guilt is gone. There my shame is gone. There forgiveness flows into my soul. There peace flows into my heart. There I find the joy and meaning and purpose in life because the one that created me and fashioned me and the one that loves me most wants to save me in his kingdom and he will not be happy unless I'm there. He'll be lonely forever unless I'm there. That he experienced that condemnation and shame that I should have experienced. He entered the jaws of death for me. What does it mean to look to Jesus? It means that day by day and moment by moment, I meditate on his love, I meditate on his greatness, and I think about the fact that, that he wants me in heaven more than I can imagine. The second thing that Hebrews talks about in looking to Jesus, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. Jesus is not only my dying Lord, my dying Savior, he is my living Lord. He is not only the lamb that died, he's the priest that lives. Hebrews 7, verse 25. What does it mean to look to Jesus? It means not only to look to the cross, but it means to look where he is now. There have been numerous books written about the birth of Christ, numerous books written about the life of Christ, numerous books written about the death of Christ. There is not a great deal written about the high priestly ministry of Jesus in the sanctuary above. Jesus is alive. I have stood for hours waiting to go in to Lenin's tomb when I was lecturing there in the Kremlin Auditorium and to go down and see Lenin lying in that tomb, embalmed in that glass coffin by the Russian scientists. And to think to myself, Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. We serve a living Savior. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore he is able... Therefore, he is able, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost the, those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Grace is greater than sin. The power of God is greater than all of my inherited or cultivated tendencies toward evil. What does it mean to look to Jesus? It means that I recognize that he is there in the sanctuary above, that he is alive that whatever troubles me, troubles him. That whatever concerns me, concerns him. Whatever perplexities harass my soul have already bothered him. That there's nothing too small for him to notice. That I can bring my burdens, my sorrows, my joys, my longings, everything that it is in my heart I can bring to him. Why? Because he is not dead. He is not in some tomb where the worms have destroyed his body and he's gone. The tomb is open. The stone rolled away. The Roman soldiers fell over like dead men. Christ came out and he's alive, looking unto Jesus. I look to his cross as my savior. My guilt is gone. My shame is gone. My condemnation is gone. I look to his high priestly ministry. He is alive for me. He con he's concerned about me. He sends to you and to me his strength and power. But there's one other aspect of this that we need not miss. Back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. As Jesus hung on the cross, and all the condemnation and guilt and shame of sin crushed out his life, as the darkness surrounded the cross and he could no longer see through the portals of the tomb, and he imagined himself being separated from the Father forever, but yet made that conscious choice to go into the grave for me, what was it that enabled him to hang on? Why did Jesus endure? Why didn't Jesus just call 10,000 angels and leave the cross? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the author of your faith, and he's the finisher. The one who began something in you will finish it. The one that began something in you will finish it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When the nails were being driven through his hands, and the crown of thorns jammed upon his head, and when excruciating pain ripped his body apart, and when the guilt and condemnation of sin was crushing out his life, and when the weight was so heavy upon his shoulders, and darkness surrounded the cross, when he could no longer see the Father's face, and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he hung there, he looked beyond what was by faith to the joy that was set before him. He imagined eternity at that moment. He thought about you being with him forever. He thought about those who he would redeem, be, who, who he would redeem by his blood. He thought about the joy that was set before him, the embrace of the Father, the Father whispering in his ear, well done, son. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He thought about the praise of the angels, worthy, worthy is the Lamb singing. He thought about you and me, gathering around that throne. When the journey is long and the road is rough, when the clouds are dark, when the trials are great, when you feel like throwing in the towel, look beyond what is to what will be. Look beyond time to eternity. Look beyond the moment to the forever. Look beyond the here to the hereafter. And imagine yourself going through those golden gates of glory and Christ coming to you and throwing his arms around you, saying, welcome home, my child. You belong here. You're a son. You're a daughter of God. This is for you. Welcome home, my child. Dan Crawford was the successor to David Livingston. And when Dan Crawford was 19 years old, he wondered what he was going to do with his life. And one day a preacher came to Scotland where young teenager Dan was brought up. He was a committed Christian, went to church that day, and William Annett came, and he had just come back from Africa in the late 19th century. And he talked about the great need of Africa, talked about the death of David Livingston, talked about thousands of villages in Africa that did not know Christ. And there was a young 19-year-old boy in that audience, Dan Crawford, and his heart was stirred. And he said, I need to give myself to something that matters. I need to do something that counts. I can't simply waste my life away. So he left for Africa. I am not suggesting that everyone needs to travel to Africa, India, the Middle East. Some will hear that call, but I'm not suggesting that. There's a mission field for wherever you are. 
There's a mission around you for Jesus Christ. But this young man felt the call of God and he went. He spent, he was in Africa for 20 years. He came home once to England, then he went back for another 15 years. He spent 35 years there. He went to the most primitive places, and it was primitive. Lived in the jungles. Learned the languages of the people. Began to translate the Bible into their languages. One night, he was 56 years old. He was sleeping in a little hut, had his table behind him. He reached back to get something off the table. He had blown out the lantern. He reached back and he gouged his arm on the side of the table. It began to bleed. He didn't think much of it. He wrapped it that night, kept it wrapped the next day. Within 24 hours, he had gangrene. His fever rose in his body, and he was just shaking, sweats, shaking. And natives gathered around him, and there in that hut he died. When they brought his Bible back to England, they opened his Bible, and these words were written in the flyleaf of his Bible. They so impressed me that I wrote them in the flyleaf of my Bible. I read them almost every day when I open my Bible. And here's what Crawford wrote. I cannot do it alone. The waves dash fast and high. The fog and mist set in. The light goes out in the sky. But I know in the end, we too shall win. Jesus and I. A coward, wayward, and weak. I change with the changing sky. Today I'm so strong and brave. Tomorrow I'm too weak to try. But he never gives up. And in the end, we too shall win. Jesus and I. Let's sing that song. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. I don't look within. There is shame and guilt. I don't look without. Others will disappoint. I do not look behind me at my failures or my mistakes. I do not look too far in the future for its anxieties and worries trouble me. But I look to Jesus. I look to Jesus. I look to Jesus. He is the one that wants me in heaven more than I can imagine. He is the one whose strength is mine. He is the one who is coming again for me. I look to Christ as my dying Savior. I look to Christ as my living high priest. And who for the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame and endured the cross. There is a joy set before us. That joy is unimaginable the joy of his return, the joy of eternity. And so because we look to him, we can keep pressing on the upward way, keep gaining new heights every day. Let's stand and sing it together.